So the, this is attempt nine, and I think this is where we're going to kind of roll with it from here. Um, and as usual, I've got a Creative Commons slash. In this play, case, I believe it's under the the GNU General Public License or the General Public Documentation License or some some variant of that. I kind of treat it as if it's uh, GPL. Uh, so if you have this and share it, uh, it is okay to share it. Uh, it came from a website that I believe no longer exists. I should actually bring it up called Agnula. Let's see if Agnula still exists here. Looks like it does. Um, Agnula is a volunteer based project aiming to spread Libre software in the professional audio and video arena. GNU's main task is the development of a reference multimedia distribution for a GNU Linux operating system based completely on free software as approved by the Free Software Foundation. Our latest distribution is used by several or several web hosting companies such as Bluehost for editing audio and tutorials, etc. Based on Debian, has some members and partners, but this isn't what I was looking for. I can't find it anymore. The website is gone. But in any case, uh, one of my favorite musicians that happens to even possibly be listening, who knows? Uh, she is on Facebook here, so you can add her and ask her for her music, but you can get a listen of this one. This is Hopefully by Maria Panzeri, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right. And it is, again, hopefully free uh, to, for you to listen to and do all kinds of cool things with. So have a listen.
I think that was one of her shorter ones. Uh, she does have a, a good couple of tracks that used to be on the internet. I'm looking right now and not seeing them anymore. So again, if, if you look and you can't find it, get in touch and I'll see what, if I can set you up with more of that, if that is the sort of thing you like listening to. But as usual, there's all kinds of things in uh, the commons out there. So this week uh, is a little bit of a downer for me. I, I guess, broke up with my girlfriend of almost a year, uh, Shannon, uh, which is kind of a harsh thing for me. And the, the biggest thing certainly in, in my life this week, we're still kind of talking, but I'm, I'm starting to, to lose hope that anything is going to be uh, recovered from that. Uh, so this week hasn't been the most productive week in the world uh, for me personally. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a hard thing to go through, right? Breaking up with someone that you, you care so much about. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I know she, does, she doesn't tend to listen to these, so there's, there's no sense kind of calling out to her uh, through this media, but uh, it, it, it is a big loss uh, that I have uh, unfortunately had to endure this week. Uh, so that that's probably the, the biggest thing this week and but there are other things going on so one thing uh, That I want to get into other than that and this is going to be a bit of a, a shorter show because of that uh, most uh, Shows are going to be expected to be a little bit longer. Never mind all this being uh, cut up uh, into uh, all these little tiny videos as we've had so much technical difficulties uh, but that is definitely uh, one thing that's going on this week. The, uh, the second thing though, uh, this is from Dr. Roy Shestowitz. Actually, I think I lost the original tweet here. This is great. Microsoft NewsGuard. This is from uh, probably the, uh, one of the furthest right sources that I you know, kind of view on a half regular basis. Uh, this is from LifeSide News. Uh, quote, new app in Microsoft software or Microsoft browser labels Drudge Report, Breitbart life site as, quote, false news websites. Uh, this is from LifeSite News, which is kind of like a pro-life conservative website. Microsoft is the latest tech giant taking upon itself to police so-called, quote, fake news, packaging an app in its mobile browser that warns users not to trust various news websites, including a number of conservative ones. NewsGuard is an extension available for most browsers that displays a green check mark or red exclamation point next to users address bar to denote whether websites satisfy criteria such as whether the site regularly publishes false content, reveals conflicts of interest, discloses financing, or publicly corrects reporting errors. This is achieved by a team of quote trained journalists and experienced editors rather than algorithms. Uh, NewsGuard uses journalism to fight false news, misinformation, and disinformation. Our trained analysts who are experienced journalists Research online news brands to help readers and viewers know which ones they're trying to do legitimate journalism and which ones are not, a NewsGuard website states. Uh, da -da -da -da. And news, NewsGuard is a free optional feature that most users have to download for themselves if they want it, but Microsoft is now pre-installing it in mobile versions of Microsoft Edge uh, TechCrunch reports. The warnings do not display the, on default, but can be activated by simply enabling news rating in the settings menu. Microsoft's Edge experiment with NewsGuard isn't a solution to that issue, but baking some kind of news verification tool right in the browser does feel like a step in the compelling direction. TechCrunch's Taylor Hatmaker writes approvingly, but others warn of its ideological bias in execution. While some right of center websites, such as the Federalist and the Conservative Room, review receive green check marks. Others, such as the Drudge Report, the Blaze, Breitbart, and PJ Media are given warning labels. Life Site News receives a warning label itself, with NewsGuards falsely claiming the website, quote, general, generally fails to maintain basic standards of accuracy and accountability, has, quote, repeatedly misstated medical research about abortion, and, quote, regularly cor correct, corrects or clarifies errors. And then it kind of goes on about how it kind of perceives this as a, uh, you know, problem. But continuing on, NewsGuard does flag the left-wing daily costs as red, and other, though other left-wing sites that conservatives have criticized for deceptive content, including Fox, Think Progress, and Rewire, are given green check marks. Even Media Matters for America is given a clean bill of health. 
Breitbart notes that BuzzFeed News and Rolling Stone are marked, untru- or are marked trustworthy as well, despite both publications being some of the high-profile stories that were reluctant to retract even after being debunked. Uh, Microsoft is partnering with NewsGuard to offer a NewsGuard browser extension on Edge and as a feature in Microsoft Edge mobile apps for iOS and Android to help our customers evaluate news sources. A Microsoft spokesperson responded in a statement to Breitbart. So long story short, uh, this NewsGuard, currently optional, more or less optional plugin, becoming increasingly less optional in the Microsoft platform with time. The conservatives are the ones complaining about it right now because they're the ones uh, that are kind of, uh, let's say, uh, attuned to this problem. Uh, I did not hear about this from more left-leaning news sites. I only heard about it from conservative sites. Uh, and life site news, it, you know, may or may not have problems with accuracy uh, in regards to things like abortion, their, their kind of main thrust. But there is a danger. Microsoft, the ability to vet what is and is not legitimate news by default. Now, if it remained a uh, optional thing, uh, and if it remained a uh, just another way for you to double check that, oh, hey, this isn't Pravda or this isn't the CBC or something, uh, then sure, there, there's there's something to be said for that. But it, as you can tell, as soon as they released it, people started arguing about what exactly is and is not a legitimate source of information. And sure, it's just LifeSite News complaining right now. But I would expect as time went on, you'd also see things like the Linux Journal and the Free Software Foundation and other enemies of Microsoft find themselves in the crosshairs because Microsoft has every interest in excluding them from analysis and debate of their own offerings of the broader uh, software development world, uh, of the broader world of technology. And they have certainly been willing to censor in the past and through partnerships like with this news guard uh, have attacked these source of it, sources of information in the past. But this gives them kind of a wedge in between the reader and the news source to control who gets access to what information. And sure, right now it's just on their platform. If you don't use Microsoft, it's not a threat to you. And yes, there are going to be places like schools and governments uh, where this kind of filter, whether it's Microsoft or not, is going to exist. But this uh, filter in particular uh, is interesting because of the next story. So remember, this, this, this partnership is with this NewsGuard, this kind of branch of Microsoft called NewsGuard. So what's, what's the next thing? This is from TechCrunch. Microsoft aims to modernize insecure voting with election guard. When it comes to voting, we're a long way from dropping pebbles into a, a morph or amphora, which is I think how the Romans did it, uh, but not nearly far enough if the lack of confidence in our election system is any indication. Microsoft is the first major tech company to take on this problem with a new platform it calls election guard that promises to make elections more secure and transparent. And yes, it's free and open source. And I'm just going to stop reading there. I have read a little bit about this, but let's just take this a little bit apart. First of all, when Microsoft says that something's open source, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily fully open source or at least fully free and open source software. Microsoft has a really bad habit of assuming that the word open source or the the term open source just means you can see the source code under some Uh, possibly onerous condition. And so when they release, they may even release the source code to this, but they may not release it under any kind of license that allows you to have the four fundamental freedoms that are important when dealing with software. The fact that Microsoft has so repeatedly abused this term open source and refuses to use the more accurate term and more important term, free software, uh, gives you a pretty good clue that you're being swindled here. And Perhaps it is free, free to use. Uh, I would expect that it's probably going to be something that they in some way or other get money from. 
uh, but it wouldn't have to be. They they are they have an, an, another incentive to, involved here that is perhaps more important. So continuing on a little bit, set to be made available this summer and piloted during the 2020 elections. Again, stopping right there. So the 2020 American uh, federal elections are going to be involving this election guard. Um, and so Microsoft is squeaking its way into this already fairly corrupt, uh, thanks to premier voting solutions um, and their overt promise to hand the election over to, I think it was a premier that the CEO of one of those companies, one of the larger online voting or digital voting systems companies outright promised to give the election to Trump. And sure enough, that's the way the election went. And so you have this voting system, this election guard that went right at the beginning. If you look at what can you compare it to? Well, you can compare it to this, the news guard, right? So it's, it's putting a wedge in between the voter and their vote actually being counted in the same way that news guard puts a wedge between the reader and the information source that they're trying to read. And right now, maybe it'll even work properly. Who knows? Maybe for the first couple of elections, if we give Microsoft this power, they'll even use it and uh, be legitimate and about board with it until they have enough power and enough uh, monopoly status that they don't have to anymore. And they, they could be subtle about it. This is not something that they may be able to even get away with being overt about. But just the fact that we're the Americans are considering putting Microsoft in between their right to vote and their vote being counted, that's that's terrifying. And uh, so they talk about how this might let their voters uh, track their votes, quote, securely and privately, unquote, and while also allowing author authorities to tabulate, store, and if necessary, audit them. Uh, but is this going to be only on Windows? And is it going to matter if it's on Windows? Uh, it's not going to be very secure and auditable if it's on Windows. There's no such thing as secure and auditable on Windows at all. It's just a total joke. Here in Thunder Bay, we had uh, or, or an online voting system, including uh, Windows machines that were set up in the poll booths themselves, or at least in the in the, the building where the, the poll booths were. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that, that is not a legitimate way to count votes. We have, as citizens of Thunder Bay, Thunder Bay, no idea whatsoever what actually happened in the last election because more than half of the votes were tabulated on this system that was not reproducibly built, that was not, the, the source code is not available for public review, that the building environment was not available for public review. It, it's just a completely opaque system and with a complete, completely opaque outcomes. So this is what they're going to be exporting to the entire United States in the ele next election. It's bad enough that most or, or a lot of uh, uh, regions in the United States use these die gold slash premier voting system machines where you can just expect that they're not going to be legitimate. This is going to expand this, this problem in a deeper uh, level, but it's also going to expand it from the perspective of Microsoft, right? Microsoft isn't like die gold. Die gold came into the election side Yes, they had a lot of businesses or a lot of business in the casino, casino market and the ATM market, but they weren't Microsoft. Microsoft is big enough to actually take over a U.S. election. That is how big they are. And so the fact that they're even going this far, that they're, that the U.S. government's even considering putting them in this role is, is a pretty good sign that things are terminally broken in the United States. So that, that's the, the first thing I kind of wanted, or the second thing I wanted to kind of talk about. The third thing is uh, something that happened about two weeks ago, which is that my uh, friend Ambiru or Gameru or Jero on Twitter has been banned or suspended at least. And so this is from his Steemit page. Steemit is a blockchain based social network where you kind of get paid for every like you get. Uh, it, it isn't perfect. It isn't owned by Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, etc. It is kind of decentralized. I understand you can run servers for it. I've never heard of anyone su successfully do so. Uh, but there are incentives, just like there are incentives on the side for Bitcoin, for people to run their own Steemit servers or Steam servers. But uh, 
th this is from his post there. Anyway, I'll talk a little bit more about Steam after the post, I guess. But, uh, quote, hello, I've been away for a while. First I was sick, and then we had to move back to our own apartment after the renovations. Now here's a story that will blow your mind. It appears someone got a pepper in their nose and decided to, quote, teach me a lesson because I didn't believe their claim that removing the microphone from someone making trouble is akin to censorship. This, this, and so it shows the tweet. Uh, and this is in Finnish, so I'm going to probably butcher this, but it's uh, at Petri2020, at Jani Turku, kiss Kyrgyzitus on Tahalan Imer... <laughs> yeah, I can't even do it. It's, it, it's, it's just a, t a Finnish tweet. But uh, the, the tweet in English reads, quote, I see that the cryptos are on the rise again. What do you think about John McAfee's bet over Bitcoin getting $1 million before 2020? I think it might be possible. There are not nearly enough Bitcoins to satisfy the big buyers that are waiting to get in. Bitcoin is at 4,700 pounds now, and I don't think it's going to return to the 3,000 pounds levels again. Actually, let's double check that. Going to coin market cap. So it's actually over 6,000 now. Oh, I see. He's suggesting it's not going to fall by like half. It could happen. Anyway, continuing on. If you want to buy one, now might be the last chance before the price will get too high. Anywho, I'm going to go read some Jules Verne to my boys now. See you later. This was uh, worthy of having his account suspended. So this is the reason why. Quote, promoting or encouraging suicide. We've temporarily limited some of your account features. What happened? We determined that your account violated the Twitter rules, specifically for one, violating our rules against promoting or encouraging suicide or self-harm. Uh, you may not promote or encourage, or encourage suicide or self-harm. When we receive reports that a person is threatening suicide or self-harm, we may take or we may take a number of steps to assist them, such as reaching out to that person, providing resources such as contact information for our mental health partners. Which, by the way, they don't tell you that if you reach out to those mental health partners, that that is monitored. It kind of gets under my skin when people don't do that, but Twitter doesn't anyway. If you are having thoughts of self-harm, suicide, or depression, we encourage you to please. Reach out to someone and request help. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Long story short, his message had nothing to do with suicide. Uh, maybe the self-harm involved is you giving your money to someone to acquire Bitcoins. And that is, in a sense, if Bitcoin goes down, harming yourself. And if you're the type of person who sees Bitcoin as totally worthless, then incur someone else encouraging a third party to buy Bitcoin before it is too late uh, would in, in some strange little way be self-harm. But still, that is why a person with 700 odd fo followers and tens of thousands of tweets gets completely removed from the public space that is Twitter. Nothing to do with what he said. It sounds like he tried to to get his account back. Uh, but again, it's it's he's writing in Finnish. Twitter obviously doesn't have someone reading Finnish. Uh, so they have to trust what the people who report him said, but that just means that people can report things that are in Finnish and have a good chance that they'll, the account that you're reporting is going to get completely removed. This really sucks for the entire country of Finland and the entire Finnish diaspora, because suddenly they can be censored with no recourse in this massive public sphere. And he was removed from it. Now he is on Steam a lot. I don't know how much of his social life is on Twitter. I don't think it's all that much. I think he used to use it for mostly just interacting with the rest of the world uh, and the, the broader uh, public uh, debates on the large topics of the day. Uh, and knowing Gerald, I, I don't think he even would encourage someone to commit suicide. I would probably be in that category. I, I've, I've probably done that once or twice probably more than once or twice in the past, but he, I don't think I ever remember him doing so. He's a lot more compassionate than I am and would be the first to get in line to give suicidal people and depressed people, even people who he doesn't really agree with on political and social issues, a helping hand to keep them from self-harm. And yet it's him, the compassionate friend, who's getting removed from Twitter. I think this is a terrible thing that Twitter has gotten to this point that uh, his voice is no longer there. You can, you can hear him and see him on his uh, Steam account, but you can't on Twitter anymore. And, and unless he's been unsuspended or unbanned, 
uh, which kind of brings me to the next point, which is I was removed from Twitter in the past week or two. And admittedly, my reasons for being removed are a little bit more legitimate. My reasons are I did break their rules and I was aggressive towards one of the other users on their site. But the thing is, when you put hundreds of millions of people in the same room at the same time, you will find that some of those people are enemies of each other. And for sure, the Motion Picture Association of America and I do not see eye to eye. And I have no problem at all calling them down. And I have no problem at all being aggressive and angry towards them. No problem whatsoever. Uh, and when I see that there are companies that are partnering with them, then again, I'm going to call them out and I'll call them out in person. I'll call them out behind and in front of their back. It's not something uh, I have a problem with whatsoever. So let's see, uh, yeah, I, I can't even get to it from here. So let's see if I go on this computer here. Okay. So I, I do still have access to Twitter as it's kind of useful to me uh, in other ways. I still have my Kurzbekistan bank account, account. I still have my Ripple account and I still have the Move the World account. I could probably log into that. So I do have a couple of accounts left, but my main account, the one that I actually use for interacting with people is it's, it's suspended. And most people, when you get suspended from Twitter, you get a, a chance to kind of redeem yourself. Let's see here. See, it was just one of many tweets I tweeted that day that did me in. It may have even been there for a couple of days without being noticed. But long story short, it's a company that does virtual reality and they want to be the future of computing. It's obvious. Uh, they're positioning themselves with the biggest content creators in the world to be the number one supplier of content in the number one platform that's going to be the dominant platform in the future. And there may be other companies that uh, are in the same space. Maybe they'll succeed, maybe they won't. But uh, they are positioning themselves to be the big threat. So let's talk a little bit about big screen VR. Big screen VR movie theater, hang out with friends, play games, and watch movies. Download our free, or download for free, it's not free software, it's not open source at all, I believe. Join our Discord. Discord, again, is not an open source platform. It is just another proprietary platform that it seeks to replace previous uh, platforms that people use to communicate between each other. So let's see the big screen website here, the VR movie theater. Watch your favorite movies with friends and family around the world. Again, they're going to have complete control over this platform. And uh, they kind of go on and on. And it's telling that they have, they're on Reddit, another source of censorship. I don't see anything about source code here, uh, but they do, they are hiring, which is interesting. But long story short, here's a company that's going to try to be the next platform, this virtual reality world platform company. And, and so if you see this, if you see this danger coming, what do you do? You can warn others about it. That's important. But one of the ways you can warn others about it is by engaging with the company itself and by telling them in no uncertain terms that their business model, their entire existence is a threat to free and open societies. And then ideally they would react to you and then you can show what you said is true and other people can see it. That's what Twitter could be. That's what this open space that is Twitter could be. Uh, when Twitter started, it, it came from Yes, it came from you know Silicon Valley or wherever, uh, but it, it, to a large extent, if I remember correctly from reading about its history, it came from uh, the people involved with indie media, and or at least the tool set involved with indie media as a way to for activists to spread information about what large corporations were doing uh, in an effective and democratic way, to be able to take information that is of public interest and rapidly spread it in a way that has never been before been possible. And Twitter did this. It did this more successful than indie media ever did. And sure, it was a, a company, but it, forming companies like Twitter 
at the time was how you took a project like indie media and made it scale, made it ideally a little bit more sustainable in the sense that there's people who work for a living maintaining it. There, there were arguments to be made that, hey, yes, it's a, a large corporation or an increasingly large corporation, but as long as they allow for this dynamic to occur, as long as it's used primarily or, or at all as a means of holding large centers of power to account, then at least there's that, uh, that you could say directly to Donald Trump or the president of the United States or the president of Russia, something, and maybe they'll respond, maybe they won't, uh, but it was, was a way for people to have a voice. But now it seems obvious that the reverse is starting to become true, that it's a way to exclude people from having a voice, that it's a way for the big powerful entities, the big companies like this big screen VR, to be able to say, oh, our product is so wonderful and you should use it. Oh, and if you criticize us uh, in the wrong way, we're just going to cut you from your entire social life. And we're going to cut you from being able to communicate with technical support of companies that you and, and, and governments that you use. And we're going to use this platform now that it's controlled by this one entity that is Twitter to silence people we don't like and to be able to possibly even to threaten to silence them. And sure, maybe if I had a phone, I'd be able to unlock my account. But if I had a phone, it means everyone else who uses Twitter would also have to have a phone. Right now, if you try to sign up to Twitter, I believe you can't do it without a phone. That's something they've changed since I started using it. Uh, that, that's an unfortunate thing because that means your identity has to be tied to your account. Your real name, in some ways, traceable from your Twitter account, unless you're, uh, you've are you been on Twitter long enough. And sure, most users aren't going to be able to get access to that. But there are cases where uh, Twitter itself is going to be able to give your information to people who you don't want to have it. If you're in Saudi Arabia and you're gay, that might be a, an issue if they give your personal information to the government of Saudi Arabia. And Twitter is owned by the the saudi or at least in large part by the saudi royal family of the saudis so it is relevant when you have a system like that set up when you can't use it anonymously and when they again can have large entities powerful entities be able to credibly threaten or censor uh, individuals who are trying to hold them to account this is i think a terrible thing and thankfully there is an alternative in the Fediverse, and I'll leave links to the Fediverse uh, in this this video. Uh, but it, it's just unfortunate because I've been using Twitter for a long time, uh, and to the point where like I've followed thousands, ten maybe up to a tens or ten or fifteen thousand Twitter people by now, and there have been many days where I've spent a significant portion of my day on Twitter just interacting with people because there are so many millions of people on Twitter to interact with and so much important discussion happening on that platform. A lot of the, the IT and information security world happens on Twitter, not all of it. I'm, a lot of it happens in private conversations and Slack and venues that I don't have access to. But Twitter is notable in that it is more or less public, uh, in that it is more or less open, or used to be, to anybody. But now, as we can see, entities like this big VR screen or big screen VR, if they can exclude you, so can others. I was reading uh, earlier this week about how if your Twitter account is blocked by a lot of people, uh, Twitter used to, at least up until fairly recently, lower the amount of times that your tweets were being seen by other people. So for example, if you were a Jew, and you had a whole bunch of Nazis block you, but that could cause your voice to not be heard by as many people. This is kind of part of the problem of giving control over who is heard to third parties, rather than to the people who might be interested in hearing from that person. The one good thing on the side of the Fediverse is that if you say something, the people who are subscribed to you will hear it. Now, on a technical level, there are problems with that. There are bugs. There are some cases where 
the the messages don't go through as effective as they probably could. But it's it is a work in progress and it's getting better all the time. Twitter, on the other hand, seems to be getting worse all the time. It's empowering more and more groups to silence more and more other groups, which is really unfortunate. So enough about Twitter. What else happened this week? You might notice that my last video didn't make it to YouTube. Again, this is kind of unfortunate because I only used Creative Commons material or what I thought were licensed uh, Creative Commons material on that last podcast. Yet, it does seem that there are some samples that were used in that particular song that I played, uh, Paperback Writer, uh, Garador Zero's version, uh, that were not necessarily cleared, at least on the system that is fed into Content ID, which YouTube uses to decide whether or not something is legitimate or not. So my video was taken down. It was also taken down, uh, I had two hits on the same video uh, because of the, the record that I played, even though I made sure that the record, I only played the one track from it that was written 300 plus years ago and performed by someone who has been dead for long enough uh, time that his work is in the public domain and that there wasn't really any other issue. I have appealed that hit, uh, but I don't think I'm going to be able to appeal the other because his sample, Garador Zero samples don't seem, at least from my perspective, to have been properly cleared. Now, it's interesting that it's the samples that are at stake here because the RAA's history on the matter of samples is certainly not black and white. Uh, there are plenty of artists who have just openly and blatantly ripped off other artists' samples to make their art. It, not every musician is as uh, careful and as meticulous as Weird Al in clearing every single sample that they use. And maybe in this case, Garador Zero did clear them. Who knows? I don't, I don't personally know. I can't verify one way or the other, but it doesn't really matter at this point because the power that YouTube is given to the copyright holders in question give them the ability to restrict second uses of that work. So even if they had, if we can just assume for the moment that he had gone through and cleared every single one of the samples that he used, when I upload it, I'm uploading his cleared samples. They're just going to get flagged anyway. If I remix the song and repost it, even if I cleared the samples and he had cleared the samples, they're just going to get flagged on the next round through. This is the danger of content ID and the, the way that it's currently implemented. So it's interesting that that kind of got caught up in the, uh, the, the net, as it were. But as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter show because, again, I've, I've just had a, too rough of a week to, to put on a full show. So that's all I'm going to have for today. Uh, as usual, if you have any Creative Commons music to play, uh, send it to me and I'll give it a spin. And uh, if I like it, I'll put it on the show. And if you'd like this show to do anything differently, uh, definitely uh, send me a message on Ricochet. I'll post my Ricochet address, hopefully wherever this video is posted. And uh, as usual, if you maybe the pity vote here, uh, I do have subscriber star villages and Bitcoin for you to turn into if you want more of this particular broadcast. Hopefully next week we'll get someone actually showing up on this show. But uh, and hopefully by next week, the technical problems will be a little bit more steamed over. Either way, I'll see you next week, 645 on Sunday. See you then.